So let's look then at Psalm 22, shall we? Let's look at Psalm 22. Before we do, let's pray. Lord, we pray for this tonight. We thank you, God, thus far for what you've done uh, through our worship and through the fellowship. And now, Lord, we, we focus our attention and we fix our eyes upon you, the word. And we pray, God, that even tonight, Lord, that um, as we uh, point our hearts towards you, God, that you would uh, take away any distractions or any thoughts that we might have that are just, um, man, just distractions to us, God. Things that um, would just take us away from hearing from you. So, Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit, Lord, to illuminate us this evening. I pray for your Spirit to bring revelation to us, God, through the teaching this evening and the sharing of your word. And, Lord, ultimately it's your words that we want to pay most attention to, Lord. It's, it's your written word, your breathed word that we hold high and, and close to our hearts, Lord, not the word of man. And so, Lord, this evening, uh, may you impart by your Holy Spirit to us things, God, that, uh, man, we desire, that we need to know, and that we desire to, to have and to hold close to our hearts this evening and for the rest of the week. And so, Lord God, minister to us this evening, I pray in the name of Jesus and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen, you guys. Okay, Psalm 22, as I said, is a messianic psalm. Okay, uh, Psalm 22, 23, and also 24. So with this psalm, it depicts David's suffering, but it also speaks of Jesus' death on the cross. It's very important that we look to that. Now, anytime we look at the Psalms or we look in anywhere in the Old Testament, it's important that we also look for Jesus, okay? Jesus is all over the Old Testament, in case you didn't know. He is all over it. There's so many prophecies. There's so many messianic things in that to where it's pointing right to Jesus over into the New Testament. So it's very important that as you read the Old Testament, personally, devotionally, that you ask the Lord to reveal to you Jesus. Ask for him to reveal to you Jesus in the Old Testament. And so as we get into this, it is all about Jesus. And in fact, Pastor David Gusick says this, we can say that this is a psalm sung to the greatest musician, to an unknown tune, but by the sweet psalmist of Israel. Yet in it, David sings as more than an artist, but as one of the greatest prophets ever to speak, pointing more to his greater son, Jesus, the Messiah, than even to himself. And that is true. That is true. And whether David knew it or not, whether he realized it or not, he definitely was speaking prophecy this evening in these two Psalms. Charles Spurgeon says this, as Martin Luther had cited him in one of his writings. This is a kind of gem among the Psalms and is particularly excellent and remarkable. It contains those deep, sublime, and heavy sufferings of Christ when agonizing in the midst of the terrors and the pangs of divine wrath and death which surpass all human thought and comprehension. I think he summed it up there, Sir Spurgeon does, to where how many of us here in this room can actually identify with our Lord's suffering on the cross. We're getting into the Easter season, are we not? We're getting into the Easter season. It's very appropriate that we begin thinking and turning our hearts, fixing our eyes and our hearts towards the Lord and towards this time of year. It's the time of year that we as Christians celebrate, in a sense, I want to say that celebration because we know the end of the story, right? We know the end. So we can celebrate, in a sense, knowing that as Christ went to the cross, that by his going to the cross, he provided for you and me a way. He provided for us a way to the Father, a way that prior to the, the death of Jesus, there was no way to God the Father. The only way, as Jesus has said himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father except by me. Those are his words. And so as a result of that, and we get into this time of reflection and remembering and celebrating too, because we're going to celebrate on Easter Sunday, because that's Resurrection Sunday, right? Amen? I mean, that is truly it. And we celebrate now even because we know the end of the story. It's a good ending. It's not like one of those stories you read to where the ending is just really depressing and the ending is really bad. 
Now, if we just stopped the story at the crucifixion and the burial of our Lord, then we would have thought like those men traveling on the way to, um, uh, oh, goodness, I remember the place <coughs> they were to Bath, uh, the city of Baths. I forget the, the city that they were going to. It was the city of Baths, city of relaxing. And so they were on the road, and there who meets with them is Jesus himself, right? They were all bummed out. They were all just depressed, saying, man, Jesus said this, Jesus said that, because they didn't really know the end of the story, did they? They didn't have what you and I have sitting on our laps. We don't, they didn't have any of that. So as a result of that, um, there's no way that you and I can ever really comprehend at all the sufferings of our Lord. But we can sure remember, and we can sure uh, at this point know beyond a shadow of a doubt what he's given us through his, through, his, through his death and subsequently through his resurrection. What he's given us. What has he given us, guys? Eternal life, right? He's given us eternal life. And that is the most important thing. That without Christ, there is eternal life. I'll tell you that. There's eternal life either way you go. But the choice is, are you going to spend it with Jesus? Or are you going to spend it in hell? We say, I mean, that that's really comes down to where it is. So there is eternity, in other words. But the choice has to be made. We'll get into that tonight. The choice has to be made here and now, on this place, planet Earth, on where you're going to spend eternity, where we're going to spend it. So let's look then at some of these verses this evening. Let's look at verse 1 of Psalm 22. It says to the chief musician, said to the deer of the dawn, a psalm of David, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? You guys, I think, if you've been a Christian any length of time, those words are familiar to us, are they not? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that's the Hebrew for it, right? And so as a result of that, we know that our Lord, why do we know it so well? Because Jesus said it from the cross. So Jesus is quoting this from Psalm 22, up there on the cross, and he, and he actually quotes it. So it's an interesting psalm to where it's a description of, of the one being Jesus up on the cross. And remember, this takes place, this psalm was written somewhere 800 to 1,000 years prior to the death of Christ. A long time, in other words, okay? So you wonder, how could it be that David, because remember, crucifixion wasn't even invented at this time. It was later on perfected by the Romans. Later on, they were per perfect. They were, they were, they were man, they, they perfected killing, the Romans did. The way that they killed, how they killed, the methods that they used on... On, on killing people. They perfected them, the Romans did. Crucifixion had been around sometime before the Romans perfected it, but not at this time. And in fact, the Jews, the only way that they would, in a sense, kill someone was by what, guys? Stoning, right? So crucifixion wasn't even going on at this time. But think about it. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, David pens this psalm out and speaks pretty much specifically to the death of our Lord up on the cross, the crucifixion. David, I'm sure, was enduring some kind of trial, to be sure. David, something was going through David's mind and heart, but his suffering, in a sense, would be like Jesus' suffering that was to come in the future. That was how wrenched out he was. That's how, how overwhelmed he might have been to pen these. Imagine getting trying to get into David's head and heart and trying to figure out, well, gee, Lord, man, for a man to pen this out, what must he be going through? I, I'm not a writer. Okay, I don't write. I, a lot of you all, you have uh, journals. How many of you guys here are journals? You write. You know, praise, be proud of it, okay? Be proud of it. I'm, I, I like to write, okay? I mean, I don't mind writing essays and stuff like that. I enjoyed writing in school. But I, I'm not one of those guys that just has a journal or a diary. I never have been. I'm like, man, I got, I'm sorry, I got, I don't want to remember some of those things for one thing, but, but it's like, man, I'm I just not into it. 
But David here has the ability to write and to write songs, to write these songs, these heavenly inspired things. And in this, the thing that he writes on truly in Psalm 22 is I don't want you to get fixated on the suffering, but I want you to get fixated and think about the victory. I want you to think about the victory through the cross, the victory from the suffering, okay? The victory from the piercing, the, the victory from the nailing, the victory from the blood being shed. That, that's what I want you to think about. It all comes from a place of victory, not one of defeat at all. And so, and so in this, David is kind of going through something here. And, and Jesus, as I said, quotes this verse while he was hanging on the cross. And he's carrying now your sin and my sin upon himself. That's the reality of it. He is carrying your sin and my sin while hung up on the cross. And his, our sins just burden him. Burden him to the point to where even God the Father cannot look, cannot gaze, cannot be involved because our sin is not Jesus' sin because he is sinless, right? That's why he was the true and one perfect offering, right? So it's not his sin. He took on our sin. My sin, as I stand up here, he took. David's sin. Chris's sin, Matt's sin in the back, those guys in the sound booth, he took all of our sin. He was sinless. And all of us, we, all those sins poured onto him and the burden that was carried by him on that cross. And he felt the separation of the Father. Couldn't look at him. Couldn't, couldn't, couldn't look upon sin. That's the gravity that Jesus bore up on the cross. That, that's, that's the essence. That's the, the heaviness of what he did while being nailed on the cross. And David is going through something here to where he feels this. The, the cry of David, I think, and the cry of Jesus, I know for sure, was not one of doubt or despair to like say, relieve me from the pain. How many of us, when going through a painful situation, we want to take that Advil, or we want to take that ibuprofen, right? We want to take that painkiller because the pain is so bad. That's not the kind of cry that Christ had from the cross. It wasn't one to, of doubt. It wasn't one of despair or to be relieved even from that physical pain. But instead, I think his cry was mostly the cry that I don't want to be separated from you, Father. I, I don't want to be separated from you. Now, I don't know how you grew up or anything like that, but maybe some of you grew up separated from your fathers in some way, shape, or form. And what it, for whatever that, that, that is or whatever that means to you, it doesn't negate the understanding of it, the gravity of it, the hurt from it. Some kind of separation of sorts. Imagine Jesus, who knows the love of the Father. He knows everything. He's in closeness with his dad, in a sense. And his dad, his father, just can't, can't look upon that. And so he, he does cry out to him. And I think this is the same thing for you and for me. Because sin, like Christ taking our sin upon him, separated him from the Father, sin will separate you and me from the Father as well. It works the same way. That should be, I think, our greatest cry is when we become separated from the Father because of our sin. Romans 8 or 6.23 says the wages of sin is what? Is death. Separation. A spiritual death is what's being talked about. And an eternal death. Separated from God for eternity 
That's the kind of reality of what sin does in the lives of you and me. But Jesus, by being on the cross, he said this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And the, from the words of my groaning, Jesus could say this, and Jesus said this, so you and I don't have to. I really believe that. So you and I don't have to say that. So we don't have to ask the Father, why are you so far from me, Father? Why are you separated from me, God? Why? Because our sins through Christ have been forgiven, past, present, and future. Jesus Christ took on the burden of our sins, plural, past, present, and future. Whatever they are, whatever you've done, wherever you've been, whatever you've thought, whatever you, whatever, they're forgiven. They're on and under the cross. And God then has taken our sin and he's given you his righteousness. It's his righteousness that God knows who you belong to when you die and go to heaven. Do you know that? That he will see the righteous garment upon you, the righteous garment of his son upon you. That righteousness that you and I wear because of Christ in our lives. That's who God sees. He will see that you and I, if we have a belief in Christ, if we've given our lives to Jesus, then he will say, ah, there you are. There you are, Darren. You're, you're, you're a follower of me. You, you have my son's garment of righteousness upon you. Come on in. Come on in. What a blessing that is. So Jesus said that and went through that so you and I don't have to. Isn't that good news? That is the best news to me. I couldn't handle it. He bore the burden of our sin that separated us, and yet by his death, Jesus is that bridge. Is, is that bridge between us and the Father? Is that bridge between us and heaven? It's Jesus. That's why his arms, depicted in so many pictures and paintings and prints, are spread to, to cover a chasm that separates us from, from the Father, separates us from heaven. Jesus is the bridge to salvation. That's the truth of the matter. And because of Jesus, we're joined once again. If you don't know Jesus, then you have no joining with the Father. And then you have reason to cry out, Why have you forsaken me, my God? Why? Because there's no relationship. The relationship with God comes through Jesus, the Son, right? That's the only way. That's the only way. It's through Jesus. And again, because Jesus took that sin upon himself, we have been given a get-out-of-jail card free, right? You guys remember Monopoly? Didn't you love to go around and get that get out of jail card? You, every time you went around the block, every went around you know, that board, you got some kind of a card and you left because you knew that card was precious because one of these rolls you're going to roll in jail. And you're then going to go, I got the got out of jail card free. I don't have to stay. See, that's what Jesus has done for us in a sense. He's, he's, in a sense, that get out of jail card. We don't have to go into hell. We don't have to, to go to hell because Jesus paid the price for you and for me. That's the truth of the matter. Now, in verses 6 through 8, let me go ahead and read uh, 3 through 5 and then 6 through 8. Or two, actually. He says, oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and am, si and am not silent. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. Verse 6, but I am a worm and no man. A reproach of men and despised by the people. All of who see me ridicule me. 
They shoot out the lip. They shake their head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Interesting, isn't it? All of this should bring to us some understanding, some pictures now of our Lord. He says in verses six through eight, he says, but, but I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip, they shake their head. Yeah. You know, and then they say at the end, in verse 8, they go, well, you trusted in God, let him say you. Does that strike a chord with anybody? Well, 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 you're the son of God. You claim to be the son of God. Why don't you just have your angels come and take you off the cross? Why don't you just call a legion of angels and have them take care of things for you? Because if you're God, if you're the son of God, you can do it. How many times for us as Christians that... People have said, you know, well, fine, then call on your God. See if he'll help you. Or maybe they ridicule you because you're still going through a trial. And man, he hasn't saved that thing yet. He hasn't taken that thing away from you. And then they're like, well, come on, where's your God now? Same kind of thing. It's interesting, this worm that he refers as to himself. The worm is, a, this is an interesting worm. It's pretty amazing. And, and Isaiah quotes it and uses it specifically when he says, our sins were as scarlet, but then they were turned white as snow. And he uses the specific word for the specific worm. Tolife is the word he uses. And this worm is, is where, they, where they took the red dye from to dye their garments. But the interesting thing about this worm that I found is really fascinating, I think, is this worm affixes itself to the tree, to a tree limb, a branch, or what have you. And from it, it then the female worm, I guess, they, the babies come out, right? Well, what happens is the babies come out and then they eat the worm, the host, the host mom. And then what happens is, is because they eat the host mom, there is a scarlet dot or ring that is left on the tree because of the, the blood. But then in three days, in three days, that scarlet ring turns to white. And then it gets flaky and blows away. Is that not amazing? To me, I'm like, wow, Lord, that is so cool. You know, that is so cool. And so we can visualize it. We can actually put that picture in our mind when we think of that worm. And here, this tolap is, is that same word that's used in, in Isaiah. Isaiah said, though our sins be as scarlet, they will be what? White as snow. You know, others are going to treat us badly. You know that? Other people are going to treat you and me badly. They're going to slander us. They're going to speak bad of us. And maybe even persecute you and me in some kind of way. But when this happens, I think, I think we feel kind of wormy, don't we? I don't know. Maybe you're younger here and you're in school. Maybe you see bullies. Maybe you've been picked on for, your, for being a Christian. Or maybe you've been picked on because you're just different. Maybe you dress differently. Maybe you sound different. Or maybe you're an adult and you're at work and because you have a Bible near your lunchbox, in your briefcase, on your desk. Hey, let me, let me just say this as a side note. If you're, if you're at a place to where you can have a Bible, I'd encourage you to put it on your desk, man. Pop it right there. Pop it right there because you I, you want people to know that you're a Christian, right? Don't you? I would. My desk here in the church has one. Okay, that's a joke. <laughs> I do have one, but we're in church, right? Get the connection? That's the church. <laughs> they don't persecute me here in church because I have the Bible on my desk. But we should all all 
if we're able to, be able to put that Bible right on our desk. Let people know where we stand, who we worship. Do you know when people do treat us badly, no matter what age, um, we feel pretty low. We feel less. We feel like the worm, like David is referring to himself. Maybe you've been rejected. Maybe you've been rejected by, by other people. That, but you know what? Even if you've been rejected, even if you've been bullied on, even if you've been made fun of, even if you've been slandered, spoken behind your back, whatever it is that people have done to you, guess what? Guess what? We're to remember the victory of Christ. We're to remember the, the victory of Christ on the cross and, and, and the hope that it means through the promise of it for you and for me. And that, man, this is just temporary, right? It's just temporary. And that's it. It's going to all fade away. Verses 9 through 11 then. David goes on to say, But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. So, so, so David starts off in verse 9, but, but Lord, you're the one. You're the one who took me out of the womb. You're the one who made me trust while on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you. I was, I was yours from, from the time of my birth, from my mother's womb, and you have been my God. See how personal he is. I love that. Is, is God, Jesus, is he that personal to you? Is he a personal God, or do you look at him as like some gray-haired guy with a big beard sitting on a throne up in the clouds? He's not. In fact, so much so that he realized to a degree that he had to make a connection with his creation. And so that creation was, was shown in the image and the person of a man by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's who it was. And he made that connection in, in skin and, and blood vessels and, and everything that you and I are made of. It's the same thing. And he made that connection with us. And Christ dwelt, God dwelt here on this earth for those 33 years. And then when he ascended into heaven, he still left himself with us in the person of the Holy Spirit. To dwell inside of you. Isn't that amazing? He really meant it when he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Isn't that a blessing? You see, in verses 9 through 11, David says, You know, when I was born, I belonged to you. When I was being raised by my mom, I belonged to you. In fact, I belong to you. You are my God, says David. And I will trust you. Don't be far from me. Because there's things around me that are trouble. And as I look around, says David, there's no one here who can help me. Absolutely. Have you ever been in that situation? Yeah, there might be family, there might be friends, but in the reality of it, they won't get it. They won't understand your trial. They won't understand your plight. They won't understand the, the groaning of your heart. They can sympathize with you, but they can't empathize with you because they haven't been in your shoes, maybe. They haven't gone what you're going through. Oh, but they're around, and they'll pray for you. Praise the Lord. We love that. But it's not the same. When God is in you, He's the one who can really help. Going through a tough time, going through a trial, going through a tribulation, going through a season, a valley of dry bones, a season of rocks like Jacob. Well, guess what? God is near. God is near. He's always near. Even when we think he's not, he's always near. Amazing. You see, David knew the love of the Father for him. He knew of the Father's love for him and the Father's involvement in his life since his birth and truly since before his birth. Jesus, too, also knew the Father's love and he also knew the plan of God. He knew the plan of the Father for his life from the beginning. 
Jesus had a plan. Jesus knew the plan. That amazing ultimate missionary who came down from the heavens and spoke life. And spoke life. Amazing stuff. See, that the loving concern and involvement, I believe, of the Father in our lives doesn't start just on the day of our birth or end on the day that you and I die, is it? It doesn't begin when we pop out of our mom. It doesn't end when we get put in the grave. It doesn't end, begin or end with that. It goes way back, we're told, from the foundations of time that God knows. And it goes from then, or whatever then is, because <laughs> that's a long time, foundation of time, I don't know. And it goes all the way to eternity. You, you, you try and put a, quantify that time. I can't. It's just forever, and whatever that means, and forever in the future, and whatever that means. That's the reality of it. From eternity past to eternity future. So the Lord isn't far away from any one of us, is he? He isn't far away from any one of us, and especially when trouble is near, when there's no one around us to help us. Sometimes that's kind of good, because I think sometimes we're more inclined to go to that person versus the Lord because the person is tangible, accessible, right in front of us, right? There's great solace in that. Great solace in that, I think. And I think it's hard for us to turn to the Lord and look up in times of trouble. But God is near. 12 through 15, then, he says, Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They, they, they gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, and it's melted within me. My strength is dried up, dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. That is so amazingly draws a picture for someone who is just on the brink of death. So dry in the mouth. Have you ever been dry, so dry in the mouth that your tongue just kind of has a hard time just kind of working itself? I have. Or you just feel broken. Dried up like a potsherd, like a like a pot, like an urn, a clay urn that's been tossed aside. Well, in 12 through 15, we can see that the enemy is still around us and is around us all of the time. It's interesting, the Canaanites worshipped these bulls, the bulls of Bashan. They worshipped them as demonic entities. And so think about the picture here. David sees himself surrounded like bulls of Bashan, these demonic entities, because that's what they worshipped them as. So it was very common. And so I think David is telling us of a spiritual battle that goes on. I think it's important. Did Jesus, I think, him being up on the cross, since he is God, did he not have the opportunity to see the bulls of Bashan, the, the demonic entities around him? The Bible tells us that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, right? Can we not at least, can I not suggest to you that possibly Christ from the cross not only enduring the physical pain, but also saw the spiritual stuff going on around him? Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. I can't, I can't even describe what it could have been. But I would think Jesus was privy to that. He saw the spiritual battle, in other words, going on all around him. Jesus did all of the time. It wasn't only that Christ was in a physical 
pain and a physical battle of sorts, but Christ was also in that spiritual battle as well. And as I alluded to in Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I mean, if, if we're encouraged by Paul the Apostle to be aware of this through Ephesians 6, 12, can we not at least agree to say, I'm sure Jesus was also witnessing this when he was up on the cross? I would, I would say yes. And he had to. You know, one thing that we have to know, because we can many times be in church and Bible study and be around our Christian friends and family, that we can forget being in that Christian bubble, that the enemy is always around us. We're told that the enemy is like a roaring lion, always seeking whom he is going to devour. That's Satan. That's the devil. He's always around. And as we learned, as we've gone through the book of Job, guess what? He has access to heaven. And he has conversations with God. Wrap your mind around that. That's when we go, oh Lord, don't brag on me. Right? Don't brag on me, Lord. Look at my servant, Job. Right? I guess maybe, too, we could talk about our own hearts. That when our hearts become dry, maybe, and our worship is waning, and we don't feel close to the Lord, we have to remember the cross and what Jesus has done on Calvary. That he's bought us back, he's provided the way back to the Father, he's redeemed us, and he has saved you and I. And he didn't move from his mission of salvation. He in the garden did not uh, uh, you know, throw us under the bus, <laughs> right? He did not say, ah, I'm not gonna handle this, Lord. Guess what, Father, you understand my heart, right? Can you imagine Jesus saying that? Well, Lord, you know my heart. How many of us say that? Oh, I don't wanna do this, but God knows my heart. I, I don't wanna get involved with that, but God knows my heart. Jesus didn't say any of that, did he? he? He was a man on a mission. He was God on a mission. He was mission-minded. And that was to save the lost. He didn't back down or back out. He didn't waver from his plan of provision in spite of all the warfare that's going on around him, telling him, I'm sure, give up. Call the angels down. Let, let them uh, rescue you. You're God. If you are God, you can do this. Imagine the taunting that was going on. Imagine the taunting. Oh, if you're God. Oh, if you're a Christian. Oh, if you believe in God. If you say this and say that. Taunting us. The enemy is like always around. Just throw in your towel, man. Just give it up. That's what the enemy says. Verses 16 through 18 then. He goes on to say, For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They took and stare. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments around them, among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. So here we can actually read into this and see truly when we look at the, the, the crucifixion account, we can see that, wow, it's Jesus. And, 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 and these are prophecies that have yet to have at that time been revealed and, and completed, but they would be. And in this, we see his death. And Jesus would have this agonizing, humiliating death. It's not just, and I say just lightly, it's not just the spikes in his hands and in his feet, but the fact that he had a crown of thorns upon him, pushed down upon his skull, the fact that he had already been scourged and whipped, the scriptures say beyond the visage of any man, so he couldn't even be recognized. 
And then he was stripped naked up on the cross. Humiliation. That's why I never understood it until I came here to the South, because they're very traditional in the South. And they talk about the humiliation of Christ. I was like, humiliation? What are they talking about? And after you study, after you read, you kind of understand, yeah, there was a humiliation going on. Christ, our Lord, was humiliated and shamed and scourged. And there was much humiliation in that. The Passover lamb, according to the Bible, was not to have also any broken bones in it. Passover lamb that you would eat, sacrifice that you would give unto the Lord at the time of Passover. Our Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. He too, as we know in the, in the account, was had no broken bones in his body either. Really? Another prophecy fulfilled? Get out of here. Is that amazing? Another one. Because customarily, the way that you would die was through suffocation, asphyxiation. You would suffocate because your body could no longer hold yourself up to breathe because when you were up here, the pain that was going on wasn't in the palms, it was here in the, in the, in the wrists. And as a result of that, the pain was so much that it would go up your tendons and into your chest and into your chest muscles and you could not even bear it. And so you needed relief. And the relief was coming from the relaxing, but you had to breathe. So you had to like pull yourself up and push off of the nail on your foot, on your feet, and to gain a breath. And as a result of that, because they wanted them to die quickly, they would break their legs. Bam! Just get a baseball bat, basically. Break their legs so that they could not lift themselves up anymore, and therefore they would die. But not Jesus. Another prophecy fulfilled. Not Jesus. That one broken bone would be in his body because he said, when I am committing my spirit to you, Father, it is finished. I am complete. It is done. He died. Then to ensure the death of Christ, to make sure he was dead, what did they do? They stuck a speed stuck a uh, sword and pierced his heart. His heart literally exploded. It literally exploded because when you have that mixture of blood and water coming from the heart sack, it's an explosion. And so we can actually say that Christ died of a broken heart. For you and for me. See, that, that's, that's the amazing truth about Jesus and about his experience up on the cross. You and I, we will never go through that, will we? We will never experience this agonizing thing, the shame of being so empty physically and seeing so much spiritually. We will never experience that at all. I just saw a movie about the Holocaust night before last. This movie was to depict, and it was a true story, about this guy in England who was, who was saying that the Holocaust never happened. This woman who wrote a book called Denial supported it. She was Jewish, and she supported it, and so she was being sued. Even the Holocaust, in that movie, when they went to Auschwitz and they saw the, the remains of the gas chambers and the, the crematoriums and all of these things, as gruesome as they are, Jean and I have been to Dachau and we've seen them firsthand, these crematoriums and these places, these concentration camps. But even as extreme that is, and you and I say how inhumane that is, and not right that it is, guess what? It still doesn't compare to the death of Jesus. It still doesn't compare to what he went through. 
Think of it even in the way of ourselves when our sin is exposed and brought to light. Secret or not too secret sin that's uncovered, <clears throat> excuse me, it's going to do the same thing, excuse me, <clears throat> in these next three verses. The word to do. 19 through 29, calling upon the name of the Lord, calling upon God. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O oh, my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All of you descendants of Jacob, glorify him. And fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard, My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. Verse 27, at the ends of the world shall, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust shall bow before him, even he who cannot keep himself alive. Calling upon the name of the Lord. He does the same thing in verse 11 as, as he does in verse 19. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. Verse 11, be not far from me. He says the same thing. David calls upon the presence of God to be with him, and he calls upon the strength of God to be on him. That's what he does. He says, deliver me, save me. Is that reminiscent of our Lord? Let this cup pass, pass before me. Jesus said a similar thing. Let this cup pass before me, God. David streaks the strength and protection of the Lord. Another thing, too, he doesn't ask for the Lord in the sense he does, but I have to believe that he was prepared as God saw him through the trial. But he seeks him for protection and strength as well as to take him from that trial. I think it's not altogether wrong to ask God to say, deliver me from this trial. I know I've said it in the past. It's like, hey, you know what? That trial, that tribulation is there to grow us. It's there to strengthen us, which it is. But maybe what I do say is that we shouldn't be too quick to pray ourselves out of the trial. Let's not be too quick to do that. But it's not wrong to ask God to deliver you from the trial. It's not wrong to ask God to save you from that calamity or from that tribulation. But it seems the Lord does that, doesn't it? Because he says that you have answered me in verse 21. You have answered me because his prayer now turns into praise. He says, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, means in front of everybody, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him. And fear him, all you offspring of Israel. He included everybody. Where he says, he's not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He's not in this face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. Isn't that great that God hears you in your cry? Isn't that great that God, up in his throne, up there in heaven, wherever that is, he's up there and he hears you. He inclines his ear to us. We're told that he bows to us. Isn't that great? He's like, man, David said in a few psalms prior to that, he said, a few psalms, I forget which one it was, but he says that my, my prayers went up to the throne to the ear of God. He hears. He hears us. That's the wonderful thing about our Lord. So it's not all about death and about dying, is it? 
It's not all about the crucifixion, but it's about life and about resurrection, I think. That's what David sees here. Regardless of who's battling against us, man, the verse in 27 and 28, we read it again, all the ends of the world shall remember to turn, turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. The kingdoms of the Lord, and he rules over all the nations. Amazing. Consolation of the hurting also tells us in a way that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Romans 14, 11. But not everybody's going to be saved. When it comes down to it at the end of the day, not everyone will be saved unless they cry out to Jesus. Uh, unless they confess that Jesus is Lord. It's not then when we see Jesus is the time to confess Jesus is Lord. You will. We will. Those who don't have a relationship with him, those who don't believe in him and are going to go to hell, they will still say Jesus is Lord because they'll be confronted with his holiness, his purity, and his righteousness. They'll be confronted with that. And they'll have nowhere to look except down and say, Jesus, you are God. You are Lord. But it'll be too late. Too late. Now is the place. Now is the time to give our lives to Christ. Not then. Now is the time to confess that Jesus is Lord. See, God will deliver you and me in the quiet places of hurt. When we can't utter something out, something's going on, God will deliver you. He will minister to your hearts in those quiet places. So as he ministers to us and delivers us in those quiet places, then we are also to praise him in the public places. <clears throat> what has Jesus done for you lately? What has he done for you? How has he delivered you? How has he saved us? What has he done? Are you publicly declaring and worshiping and adoring and glorifying him before the assembly, before all of Williamsburg, before all of those on your job, before all of us at Calvary Williamsburg? Are you declaring to him? Encouragement is don't keep it to yourself. Don't hold back the praises of God. But declare them openly amongst the assembly. Obviously, we're not going to get into the next verse. I went too long, but we're going to finish this one in the next couple of seconds. Verses 30 and 31. A posterity shall serve him and will be recounted to the Lord, of the Lord to the next generation. There will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this. At the end of the day, we're to serve him. You and I, we're to serve Jesus at the end of the day. For those of us who have children, we're to constantly telling them about Jesus. Our children must always hear about Jesus. Always. There should never not be Jesus spoken of in our homes. Whether you have children or not, should always be Jesus. You can't, and I can't, I couldn't, my, my boys are grown up now and married, but I couldn't rely and depend on the church to do that for them. It's not the church's responsibility to raise them up under the admonition of the Lord. It's mom and dad, or mom, or dad. Is that their responsibility? Not the church. The church is icing on the cake and Encouragement and exhortation, maybe a little bit of 
of uh, reminding and reinforcement of the things that you, mom and dad, or dad or mom, separately uh, are, are imparting to your children separately. We're the icing on the cake. So, I really didn't have an ending for this because I was going to go into Psalm 23. But, I think the appropriate thing to do is to pray. And if there's anybody here that just has that, I guess just that thing in their heart that they just know that they need to cry out to God. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you again for your word, and I thank you, God, for this time. Man, Lord, I'm just praising you, Lord, that I even got through Psalm 22. And so, God, may you be glorified, and God, may you resonate in our hearts and our minds about what was said tonight and the scriptures that we've read. May your scriptures, Lord, may your holy scriptures, your holy word, your God-breathed word of what we read tonight, Lord, be that which, which sits upon our hearts. Not my words, Lord, but let your words, your words are the words of life. Your words are the words that change and transform. Your words are the words that take us from scarlet to snow. So, Lord, we thank you. How could we not thank you and give you praise for going to the cross on our behalf. How could we not, Lord? So God, we do thank you. Humbly we come to you tonight, Lord, and we beseech ourselves before you, God, and we say thank you. No one else would ever do that for us, but you did. And your decision was made in the garden to go to the cross. Lord, man, you are precious to us. So tonight, God, we just want to remember, we want to recall the things that you went through for us, Lord, as we get into this Easter season, Lord, may we every day think and dwell upon the victory through your crucifixion, the victory by your resurrection, Lord, all of those great things that you've done for us, and let us proclaim you throughout the ascent. So God, we thank you, we praise you, and we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you guys.